Hello. All right. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Um, I want to welcome uh, both our co-founders and CEOs, um, Daniel and Marcus. Thanks so much for coming um, with Taxify and Via. So I'm really excited to delve into what we call the future of transportation, everything from ride hailing and scooters and I don't know, maybe more. So I want to set the stage a little bit and I would love it if um, you could both explain your businesses because there are some important differences. Uh, Daniel, why don't you kick things off? Sure. So thanks. It's great to be here. Um, at VIA, we've developed what we like to call an operating system for managing fleets of on-demand dynamic shuttles. Um, these are shared sort of medium-sized vehicles that can drive anywhere around the city following a dynamic route. And in real time, we are aggregating passengers into those vehicles. So multiple passengers are sharing sharing their ride and hopefully we're doing it in a smart way so that you don't get taken out of your way. The route is very efficient. We started out by operating the service in New York City. We expanded to Chicago and DC. We are operating our own service as a marketplace and we've then found that our technology can be quite helpful to cities and public transit authorities. So we've been uh, hard at work providing our software, either licensing it or operating ourselves uh, for cities and public transit authorities all over the world. We have about 50 partners from Australia to Japan to Singapore, Europe, the United States, uh, who we are working with and providing our technology to them so that they can run a better, effectively a better public transportation system. And when you first launched, were you, was that the business model from the very beginning, which was this idea of the dynamic shuttle? Yeah, it was, you know, I think initially we had this idea that we would be a, a simply a tech company. We developed this technology and that in New York City, uh, the MTA, the Public Transit Authority would be so excited by this new idea of how to run buses more efficiently. They'd immediately want to work with us and use our tech. Uh, it turned out they, they were not as interested as we thought they would be. Uh, so we launched our own service, took a few years, sort of demonstrated that it really worked. And now we're finding that cities are looking at what we're doing and saying, oh, wow, this could be a better way to run, run public transportation. And we're having some success getting cities to adopt it. So maybe they needed a little convincing. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's yes. <laughs> it's, probably, it's probably also timing. You know, yeah. sometimes you have to get the, right, the timing right and they have to see that it works. And, and for good reasons, cities are, are risk averse. They don't want to deploy something that, for the public that isn't going to work. The, the politics of it are complex. Yeah. So I, I can understand why they were reluctant. We yeah. were disappointed at the time. Yeah. Anyways. Um, so, Marcus, talk, a lot of people here probably know, are familiar with Taxify. Um, but why don't you uh, really tell us exactly where you are operating and, and how the business has developed? Sure. So, Taxify is the largest European ride sharing company. We're now operating in uh, 27 countries across Europe and Africa. We have about 15 million passengers, and really the main competitor we have is our US friends, who probably everybody knows. But uh, we're now market by market actually getting ahead and showing that the local operating model is usually the one that's more efficient, and that's going to win out over the long term. And in terms of products, we, we started with taxis. And uh, now the business has shifted over the last five years mostly to private hire. And now we're actually gradually adding more and more transport methods on top of that. So earlier this year, we started doing motorcycle taxis in Africa. Now we started doing scooter sharing, first in Paris, and now rolling that out across Europe. So the long-term view is to be this leading transportation network across Europe and Africa that people can use wherever they travel and not only get a taxi, but any sort of ride they would need. And when Taxify first started, it was in fleet management, right? And how, why, why did you pivot? And, and when did you do that? It's, it's actually quite an interesting story. So we first of all started out by doing dispatching software and fleet management tools and a consumer facing app to taxi fleets. But the issue was that they actually weren't too interested in that. So we were trying to sell taxi companies by saying that you need to adopt new technology, otherwise platforms like us are going to come in and, and consumers are going to switch away. But being honest, most of them were just very old school dinosaur thinking. They never adopted the tech. So we actually had a similar view that we were, okay, we have the tech ready, let's just start to operate this on our own. 
and very quickly we saw that this model makes a lot more sense to be self-operated fully. Do both of you, have you noticed as it's sort of exploded this, what we call mobility sometimes, our future of transportation, that, that the folks who were maybe hesitant have now are all jumping on board? Or are people still slow moving? Are agencies or other companies still uh, not quite ready to jump in? It really depends on, on, the, on the country and then the company. So as we operate in 25 countries, we see some of these, like Estonia or, or Finland now, that are very quickly adopting new ride-hailing regulation. Companies and consumers are adopting these services extremely quickly. And then, of course, we look at Germany, where ride-hailing regulation is one of the strictest in the world. You can basically only operate with licensed taxis, and it's going to still take many, many years before the industry can really get to its full potential. So it's very much case by case. What about with the, you, you're working mostly with um, the D Department of Transportation Agency. So are you finding similar? I, I think that's right. I think it's very local. Uh, while you think about the, you know, the technology I think we're developing probably has global application. It, has to be adapted from city to city, but fundamentally it's the same product. But the politics and the regulatory environment and the partners and, and the drivers probably, the way they behave is extremely local. Um, so even within Germany, as you mentioned, some of the strictest ride-hailing regulations, ride-sharing regulations. In Berlin, we have a service that launched a few weeks ago called Berlkuning, which I'm probably not pronouncing very well. <laughs> uh, but if you haven't used it, please yeah, down, download the app yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and try, to try it. But it's a shared ride in, in vans across Berlin that is... Um, we, we operate in Europe through Via Van, which is our joint uh, partnership with Mercedes-Benz. And this is done through the BVG, the, the Berlin Public Transit Authority. So the BVG, as a public transit authority in Germany, is actually extremely, in our view, extremely advanced and has adopted this technology. Other parts of Germany maybe take quite a few more years to get to. So it can really vary even within a certain the same country. And this new service that, that just launched about two weeks ago, you said? It's about six or seven. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so how is that different from your more traditional service, or is it? So the, BV, the, the service in Berlin is particularly interesting, I think, because we needed a special license in order to, to operate it. So we and Daimler together formed this company called Via Van, that we wa and we wanted to launch service in Berlin. The, the service uh, to launch a shared ride service in Berlin was ran against the, regu the regulations, the local regulations. So we worked together with the BVG, and the BVG actually applied to the Berlin Senate and received a license. So it is a BVG service that we as Via Van are operating mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis. We use Mercedes vans and Mercedes vehicles. It actually happens to be, we believe, the largest electric fleet uh, of sort of publicly operated shuttles in the world. Um, about 80% of the fleet just runs about 100 shuttles is, uh, is electric, um, which is also an interesting uh, experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, then, and a different logistical challenge. Right? Very different, yeah. 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 So you do have different businesses, as it's clear, but you do share in many ways a similar rival, um, which is Uber. And, you know, I don't want to focus too much on it, but I think Uber is dominant force in a lot of respects. So, Marcus, I'm just wondering, has Uber or how has Uber impacted your business model? And does it inform your decision making? For example, when or if to go into a market? Overall, as we now operate in, in more than 20 countries around the world, we actually compete with them in essentially every country and city we're in. So we've always been accustomed to having quite fierce competition. But uh, what's already clear from multiple mergers around the world, whether we look at Russia, China, now Southeast Asia, it's clear that the local operating model in transportation is the one that's going to win out over the long term. So we see a similar pattern across all our cities. If you need to actually localize, then the U.S. companies aren't typically best suited to do it. And we, we see this happening city by city. Uh, we are more focused on treating drivers better, which is something that's quite unique to Europe, because the regulations are so high, you have a lot less drivers you can actually work with in every city. So treating them well is a much bigger factor than it might be in a market where the supply of drivers is, is multiple times bigger. So these exactly are, are cases that you need to keep in mind, or whether we look at working with cities, which is very important in Europe, or integrating local payments and so on, then we, we see our big benefit is localization. And country by country, we see in a few years, we're actually overtaking them. And now fast forwarding a couple of years, 
we think it's, we're going to see a similar future in Europe and Africa as we actually have already seen in other parts of the world. So is working with local regulators more of a challenge than dealing with Uber? Is that the, is that the primary business challenge? Actually, yeah, it's again country by country. So when we look at uh, Germany, for example, then whether Uber or anybody else is here doesn't change our business much. The bigger blocker is that the regulation is very strict and there's just not enough drivers for us to work with. So, so that's, that's one example. Another is that market like Poland might be less regulated. You actually have enough drivers so you can build a business that customers are going to love, but you have very fierce competition. So again, the problems vary market by market. And Daniel, what about, what about you? How does Uber factor into your business or yeah. does it? Um, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that company that you mentioned. <laughs> um, you know, we, we have, a, I, I think, a very different business model than, than yeah. Uber does. So where we are operating our own consumer service like we do in New York and Chicago, D.C., London, where we recently launched this Via Van, there we're, we're facing this quite fierce competitor, uh, I agree. But oftentimes we're finding that for shared rides, which is our core product, um, I think we have a pretty good advantage in, a, in, a, in the technology that we've developed because it was built from the ground up to, to allow people to share. And oftentimes, the way the drivers are being compensated on the Via platform kind of all fits together very well. And so we usually find that we have good success in, in launching our own services, even when Uber is competing. Um, most other places are actually not really, unlike Taxify, not really in competition with Uber. We're running what is effectively a subsidized service together with the local public authority uh, or city. Um, and so that's, it's a lot less of a consideration. Okay. You both touched on, oh, Marcus, you said, uh, treating our drivers better, and you sort of referred to the, to the same thing. What does that mean? Does it mean making it easier to use? Is it pay? So I would say in New York, I'll uh, jump in. In New York, uh, the Taxi Limousine Commission recently issued a study that showed how much drivers were making on the different platforms. And if you look at how much drivers were making on the Via platform, uh, I think on a median basis, they were making about 50% more per hour than they were on Uber or Lyft. And th it's not because uh, they're earning more when they have a passenger in the car. They earn comparable amounts when they have passengers in the car. So the way the system works, their utilization is much higher. So the amount of time that a driver is sitting around empty is significantly reduced, which means that per hour that they're on the road, they're just making a lot more money. So I think that helps us a lot, at least. Sure. Um, again, coming back to the market specifics. So when we look at Europe, you have a very constrained pool of drivers due to high regulation. So the drivers are, are something that you need to fight a lot more for, rather than consumers, actually, in many of these markets. So what we're focused on at the end of the day is how much the driver makes. Like wh whatever other perks and, and gimmicks you can do on top of that, I mean, at the end of the day, drivers care about how much pay they take. Yeah, on. they want to make more money or so, why would they do so, it? So what we're focused on, on on one hand is perks, how to actually save them costs. So in France, for example, just last week, we rolled out a huge partnership so drivers can get about 7 8% discounts on fuel with us, which other platforms don't do, or we just pay them more on every trip thanks to a lower commission. So at the end of the day, what this results in is that we're just attracting more drivers. The drivers we typically attract are then happier because they prefer us due to higher earnings. And at the end of the day, we, we see con consumers are making their choice based on that as well. So if you're more or less paying the same rate, but you actually know that on one platform the driver is happier and you have more drivers, consumers are more likely to, to move to that platform in the long term. Um, you also do have another thing that both companies share, which is a common investor, uh, Daimler. Uh, but I think that the relationships are a, a slightly different. So Daniel, talk to me a little bit about Daimler because it's a, more of a strategic investment, right? Yeah, so for us, you know, we realized fairly quickly once we launched our own service that, and this is obviously true for Taxify as well, it, the service, the experience doesn't end in the app. If you are using Venmo to, for mobile payments or uh, playing Candy Crush or whatever it is that you love to do on your phone, that usually ends and starts and ends with your, with your experience in the app. For us, the app is just the beginning and then there's the vehicle and the driver and, and traffic and the city and everything else that you're interacting with. And it turns out that when you're sharing a ride, the vehicle that you're in makes a really big difference. If you're sharing a ride with three other people in the back of a Toyota Camry, it's not a great experience. And even if it's relatively inexpensive, 
you know, you might actually prefer the bus, you might prefer the subway, there are many other alternatives. If you're sharing the back of a, of a minivan or a, a slightly larger vehicle and you've got your own seat, it just feels significantly better. Not to mention that the efficiency of that ride when you have a vehicle that can seat six passengers, we can get in and out very quickly without making other people get up. For us, the efficiency increases very significantly. So in partnering with Daimler, a lot of it was about can we get access and can we actually work together with Daimler to develop the right vehicle? Because as it turns out, there isn't really a vehicle out there that is designed to be a dynamic shuttle where you know, hundreds of people are getting in and out every single day and moving around the seats and so forth. So part of the partnership, yes, there's an investment. We've set up Via Van together, but really it's about thinking, how do we build the vehicle of the future uh, that can serve you know, a sort of dynamic mass transit system in a city at scale? So are you developing a van then? Can you talk about the vehicle that you're working on? Yeah, so I mean, we as Via are not necessarily develop, you know, starting a plan to build a van, but you're absolutely. Weighing yeah, in no, on but the exactly process. right. We're partnering to figure out how do we at first adapt the existing van, and then I don't want to speak for Daimler for their car manufacturing plans, but the idea would be, you know, if, if there's volume, which we think there is, to develop a unique vehicle for this service. So do you see in five years, Developing a vehicle takes a long time, five to seven years. Right. Developing um, a van for a Via, do you see that actually happening with Daimler? So I should, you know, again, I can't speak for, for Daimler, yeah. uh, you know, they'll, they'll get me in <laughs> trouble, but I, uh, I sure hope so. And what I can say is that even if you, you know, what we're definitely doing, which you can see in Berlin, so if you were to take this Berlkunig service in Berlin, you'll see modified uh, Vito vans that are, uh, or V-class vans, that are, are modified specifically for our service. So we're already starting to see the benefits of having this relationship. And I, hopefully Daimler feels similarly that they are getting input from consumers, from drivers about what makes a vehicle work in this application. Right, right. What about you? It's a slightly different relationship. What is your involvement with Daimler? So overall Daimler shares the same view that more and more people in 10 years are not going to buy cars, but they're going to be using vehicles on demand. They see that we are already the biggest ride hailing operator in Europe. Uh, we're growing the fastest here. And there's a pretty good outcome that we will be overall this mass transportation platform that's going to combine cars and, and scooters and all other forms of transportation a person might need to get around in one single app. And of course, for Daimler, who's one of the biggest car manufacturers, they want to be a part of that future. So the investment was, was very clearly to make sure there's a strong European player in the space as well, rather than let this be another space essentially that's run, run by a US company. Are you working on any products with them at all or projects with them, or is it more of a financial investment relationship? So the industry is still in its early days. When we look at overall on-demand rides relative to all the trips that happen in a city, we're talking about two to three percent of all trips. Mm -hmm. So the vast majority of rides are still done by private loaned cars and public transportation. Mm -hmm. So for now, it's, it's an investment into the future. And then as the industry matures and develops, there's room for collaboration on many, many fields. Mm -hmm. One of those is just vehicle financing for the drivers. Another is working together on autonomous cars in the future. So there's a number of areas that we can get into. But for now, we're just focused on, on building the biggest European platform. You brought up autonomous vehicles, and I'm wondering what both of your thoughts are on that and whether you see that technology eventually being deployed within your own company and whether that's a priority. Uh, Daniel, what, or Marcus, go ahead. <laughs> so overall, uh, how I see it is that short-term autonomous driving is seriously overhyped. So there's not going to be major consumer impact from autonomous cars for the next three years at least. It's going to take time for, these, for the technology to get ready, for the regulations to adapt, and then the rollout is going to be quite slow. So in the short term, we're much more focused on practical things that work right now, one of those being uh, scooters and micromobility. So we see that is going to have a much more tangible impact on lives of people for the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. But sure, in the long term, autonomous cars are going to come. They're going to come on platforms that you can use on demand. And one of the most logical reasons why it's going to be like that is because autonomous cars will not have availability to drive in an entire city at once. But as we currently see the tech, it's developing gradually. So you know they might be able to drive in one area of the city, but no, not in all the rest. So 
platforms that combine human drivers and autonomous driving are going to be able to cover this seamlessly. So as a consumer, you're going to say, I want to go from here to here. And we know that we can either cover that route with an autonomous car, or we're going to send you a, a, a driver. So th those are things that only the ride-hailing platforms can do. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard for me to start from scratch with a purely autonomous uh, car platform or, and compete it, with that. that. That's interesting because, not to bring up Uber again, but I will, they, they have put a lot of money and created this entire branch of their company, uh, Uber ATG, to try to be the first. And, and they've certainly dialed things back. Um, whereas Taxify, it seems like you're just going to focus on the now and the medium term. And you don't feel like there needs to be one winner. Would that be accurate in, in terms of autonomous vehicles? Sure. So there's some network effects within autonomous driving, some different parts of the, of the ecosystem. But we're very confident there's going to be a number of players in that space. So there's not going to be that Waymo is one that's going to have an autonomous car and be 15 years ahead of everybody. It's, it's more likely that there's going to be a number of players and an ecosystem of these vehicle and autonomous tech manufacturers. So what about for VIA? How does autonomous vehicle technology play into your business model? So by the way, I, I, I very much agree with what Marcus said about where autonomous vehicles are today. The, the one thing I might add is that where, where I think we might start to see applications, and I, I, I still agree with what you said, it's not going to have a major consumer impact. But on a small scale is where cities or, or it could be within uh, private sort of campuses are able to adapt the infrastructure itself to make the problem easier, whether it's dedicated lanes that are more constrained or whether you can put uh, you know, beacons on, the, on the, sign, the, the lamppost or whatever it is, I think that will facilitate uh, services. And so we'll start to see, I, I believe, over the next three years, these, these smaller services pop up in parallel to what Waymo and others are doing, where they're trying to do it more free form. Um, and that will be, that'll be interesting as, as an alternative way to launching, probably with much simpler technology. Um, as far as V is concerned, you know, we, we have a sort of similar approach. We see ourselves developing software that sits at the network level, uh -huh. not at the individual car driving level. And there are going to be probably multiple providers. Uh, they will be a part of our network, we hope. But um, it's not the short-term focus. Right. So speaking of the future, because we have to wrap up uh, shortly, I'm curious about one of your big investors is Didi. And I'm wondering what the future looks like with Didi. Um, do you think they might try to acquire you or, overall, or just it, invest in you more? Overall, it's, it's becoming quite clear that the local operators have quite a big advantage over just trying to do one generic platform and actually operate it in every country. So we see it's more likely that the six, seven big ride-hailing players that are there right now are going to be still there in five years and each doing their localizations. So when we look at our markets like in Africa with safety, local payment methods, these are things that actually take quite a lot of time to develop and you need to localize. So we don't think there's going to be one global fits all solution. Mm -hmm. And you recently got into scooters. Are you going to get into other businesses as well in the next year or two? Food delivery is one option, bike share. We're, we're, we're looking at, uh, at all, all the ways how to move people around. So that's what we're focused on in the short term. And, and right now, we see that ride hailing and scooters are the two best uh, things to focus on in, in that sector. And then as a market, the US? Is there any interest in going there? No. So for us, it's Europe, Africa. We want to win these regions, be the best platform for people to move around here. And what about for Via? What does the next year look like for you? Are you going to suddenly get into scooter business as well? So we're also adding scooters uh, mostly, again, for partner cities where they're okay. looking to provide a holistic transportation solution as a public transit um, offering to the residents. I think you know, for us, the, the vision is to take this platform we've developed. I think it's a little bit of a different uh, business, again, from Taxify. So we do have a view that it can be global. And uh, you know, by the end of next year, we'd like to be in about 300 different cities, uh, powering the public transit system in each of those cities, and Great. working hard at it. Interesting. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, everyone. Round of applause for these guys for coming up on stage. Thanks for having me. Is your phone? My phone. Yeah.